Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. Today I'll be presenting with Sheena and Abby of Hesta and we'll be sharing with you how Octa can help increase customer trust while simultaneously optimizing the end user experience. Sheena and Abby, before we get started, do you want to introduce yourselves? Hi everyone, I'm Sheena Peters. I'm the General Manager of Technology for Hesta. Um, I've been in technology for a number of years and have the privilege of uh, doing something I really love, which is um, solving customer problems. So hopefully today um, we get to um, give you some insights on how we've solved some problems um, in our customer experience uh, at Hesta. Abby Majid, Enterprise Architect. Uh, been around in trenches, IT trenches for over 20 years. At Hesta, I'm responsible for architecture engineering function within the enterprise IT. Um, I consider myself an advocate for shifting left secure by design, aka adoption through agile governance and value chain from business requirement through to enabling cool technology toolkit. Uh, and then I'm Heather Wallander. I am the Commercial Specialist Team Lead at Okta, focusing on customer identity use cases, similar to what we'll be talking about today. And just as a quick reminder, we will have be answering questions in the chat throughout this presentation. So if you have any questions as we go along, feel free to ask them there. Our agenda today will cover three different topics. First, we'll start with the dilemma many companies face when deciding between prioritizing security or the end user experience and the potential risk of going too far to one side or the other. Then we'll share how Okta can help you find the balance for both without having to compromise on either. And then we'll jump into the different features that Okta offers. And instead of just sharing those with you or telling you about them, we'll actually show you those in a live demo. And finally, we'll hear from our experts, Sheena and Abby from Hesta, to hear about how they've implemented Okta at their company to find this balance. Going into that dilemma many companies face, what we often see is that even those that want to prioritize security, they're often concerned with implementing unnecessary user friction. And when they're trying to balance the two, what we typically see is that the scales tip in favor of usability. And this makes sense. We're in the age of the consumer. Today, customers want to get what they want, when they want it, wherever in the world that they are, on whatever device that they're closest to. They expect companies to read their mind and either present them with products that they'd love or have the products that they're searching for readily available. And once they find them, they want that checkout process, that closeout process to be quick, fast, seamless, secure. And if you can do all of those things, they'll happily give you their money, loyalty, and recommend you to friends. But on the other side of that, if you make a change or mistake that they don't like, they'll potentially walk away from your business and never come back to use it again. And this is, the statistics support this. 73% of companies with above average customer experience perform better financially than those than their competitors. And 57% of users have reported that they've stopped buying from a company because they felt a competitor had a better user experience. But what's often overlooked is that security impacts end user experience also. 64% of customers have said that they blame the company, not the hacker, when their personal data or information is lost. Unfortunately, we still continue to see security breach headlines in, through 2020. In, Last year, Marriott reported that 5.2 million guest records were stolen in another data breach when the login credentials of two employees were obtained. And on the consumer side, Nintendo reported that 300,000 accounts were hacked. And while they didn't release the method that the hackers used, we do know that it was linked to the legacy Nintendo network identity system and duplicated credentials. Now, to their credit, Nintendo has since implemented password resets and encouraged their users to implement MFA. But one thing that we like to point out is that when you implement these, these solutions proactively, it can help mitigate the impact if this does happen. Also pointing to how hackers are constantly adapting not only to the technology available to them or what is companies are putting in place to protect themselves, but also to the changes in our environment. Last year, when COVID forced employees to start working from home in rapid numbers, employees targeted specific Twitter employees acting as tech support and pointing them to a website so that they could implement their, they could input their credentials. And then the hackers could use that to gain access to VIP Twitter accounts, including political and celebrity, political figures and celebrities in a Bitcoin scam that made headlines. And even more surprising, first quarter of 2020 last year, COVID-19 th themed phishing attempts reportedly increased a staggering 600% which means that before we had even realized yet what the impact the impact of COVID-19 was going to have on our lives, hackers were already adapting to this and implementing uh, this into or incorporating this into their attacks to make it more effective. 
They're also adjusting with our changes in behavior. Because there was an increase in web application traffic, 43% of breaches were attacks on web applications. That was more than double the year before. And 80% of those web app attacks were using stolen or brute force credentials. And these, these statistics tell us that we can't continue to ignore security. It has to be prioritized. And luckily with Okta, we help you find the balance between both. Implementing features that inc increase the usability for end users while simultaneously allowing you to implement security when a situation calls for it without having to do it every single time a user authenticates. And as I mentioned earlier, rather than telling you about these options, I'll actually be showing this to you in a demo today. So going into my profile, you can see I have two users here. One is my I'm a big deal user and one is my I'm, I am standard user. My I'm a big deal user, that's going to represent my high value, high security accounts with a higher level of access. My I am standard user is going to represent my standard user who still needs security restrictions around their environment, but maybe not to the same level. But before we start talking about the difference between these two, I do want to point out an option that you can implement in any auto tenant that allows you to leverage the maintenance efforts that we are making that we are taking to protect both our, our tenants and our users. Octa maintains a constantly evolving list of IPs that exhibit suspicious behavior suggested malicious activity. So things like brute force attacks or credential stuffing. And with this option, you can enable, you can block these malicious IPs from activity on your tenant. You can also choose to simply log those if you just want to track that behavior. But if you'd like, you can log and block those. To show what this looks like for your end users, we'll jump in really quickly to another end user uh, so that we can show what happens if we spoof an IP address that has been flagged as potentially malicious. And what we'll see is that when I go in to log in as this user, I'm gonna to be told that there was an unexpected internal error. Now this is somewhat vague. It doesn't really tell me what happened, but if I jump back into my Okta demo environment or my tenant, we can check the system log and see that the end user was in fact blocked because of the su suspicious activity. And I can actually even see what behavior triggered that. So in this case, the user was engaging in password sprays and that is why the, the IP address has been flagged and why it was blocked. Now we'll actually come back to this and see it, and share more information that's available in the system log later in the demo after we've seen some authentication attempts or some completed authentications. For now, we'll jump into some of the security policies you can implement and starting with passwords since so many of the breaches involve password attacks. So for example, with high security users, I want to have extreme level, a higher level of precaution or higher level of security. So in this case, I've actually made a minimum length of 15 characters, which is quite high. And then I actually have complexity requirements that have implemented all, all options within Okta, as well as restricting the use of common passwords. I've elected to reduce or require the users to not use any password that they've used in the last 10, uh, the last 10 passwords. And on top of that, I will lock the user out after three unsuccessful attempts and send the lockout email to the user. Now on the end user usability side, we have enabled password resets, but in this case, I've chose to restrict it based on the location and the ge geographic zone. So for example, maybe my user base is primarily in the United States. And so only those users that are in the United States can change a password or do self-service reset. If they leave the United States, they're actually not going to be enabled to do this any longer. Whereas on my standard user side, I've significantly reduced the requirements down to eight. I removed the requirement for symbol and I'm only enforcing the password history for the last four passwords. In this case, I'm also going to unlock the account if it's been locked out after 60 minutes. And there is no restriction around geographic zones. Now, this may or may not make sense for your environment, but my goal here is to show you the flexibility that you can implement these policies so that they do make sense for what you need to put around your applications. Once you actually have once you've enabled those different passwords, we can jump into the different multi-factor types. Octa supports multiple different types out of the box where you can just turn it on easily by just enabling or deactivating. This includes biometric options such as using WebAuthn with Windows Hello or Touch ID or using biometric options with the Touch ID or Face ID on Octa Verify. Once I have those enabled, I can actually even separate the policy between the two types of users. My high security users, there are situations around authentication where they have to use Octa Verify or WebAuthn. And so those are gonna be required for those users and the rest, option, the rest of the factors are going to be optional. My standard users, 
I'm never going to prompt them or require them to do the biometric option. And so they, I've just enabled the more common factors on customer identity, SMS, email, and voice call, because they allow the user to use what they already have rather than requiring them to take additional, additional steps to enroll. And now that all of that has been set up, all of that has been configured, I can jump into using this information to set sign on policies. There are two options with this. One of them is to use Okta's machine learning and our understanding of the user's typical behavior to implement stepped up authentication. The other is to specify based on your specific app environment and users, what policies you wanna implement. And we'll see both of these. First with the machine learning option, Basically, this will classify each authentication as an automatic risk level, low, medium, or high. And I can set the requirements based on those thresholds. So if it is low risk, meaning that like the user is logging in from the same device, same IP address, same time of day, user behavior is very typical and the user is likely very much themselves. I'm just going to require a password, no need to introduce user friction with, unless necessary. Now, medium risk might require stepped up authentication, something in the user's behavior has changed. Maybe it's their device, maybe it's their location. And in this case, I'm going to require a secondary factor, but I'm not going to specify what factors until I get into the high risk. And in this case, perhaps it's a change in country, perhaps it's a change of country and something like impossible travel, meaning that I just logged in from one state an hour ago or five minutes ago, and then five minutes later, I'm logging in from another state, another country in which case I may want to implement stricter requirements, going away from a password entirely. So in this case, I'm gonna use a pure authentic factor authentication and either do two factors or a specific biometric factor. Now, if I, I prefer to have more specific policies set or, set or have more control over these, I can also do that and implement rules around geographic zones that I only wanna allow access in or behaviors. So for example, with my networks here, you can see if the user is not in the United States, I can implement a rule that says that they are going to be denied access. Now, I can also block countries entirely. So you can see I have a block list here where I'm blocking anonymize or anyone coming from a Tor anonymizer proxy. So essentially anyone trying to hide their originating IP address. But if I had wanted to, I could have also specified different countries here and added those as well or set those as separate requirements for blocking around the dynamic policy zones that I can implement into my sign on my sign on authentication, I could have actually expanded this even further and added Canada and Mexico if I wanted to make this more about North America or added various regions where I have customers. Or I can drill down to be more specific around a specific state or region or even a specific IP address. Now, once I get down to the behaviors, then I'm going to start looking at changes in the user's uh, activity. So new country, new state, or a velocity going back to that impossible travel. And these are based on the behavior detection thresholds that I set. So in this case, I've actually lowered country and state down to one authentication, but I could easily modify these up or down. And basically what this is gonna check is if I've changed either of those from the last authentication versus velocity is going to check with for how fast would I have to be traveling to be in the location that I'm in, trying to log in from right now versus where I logged in from last. So if I'm in New York and I try to log in from Miami in an hour, definitely going to trigger that that 805 kilometer hour threshold or 500 miles. And if any of these are triggered, I'm going to require specific factor sequence. I want the user to do Octa Verify push and what about then? But I'm also going to reverse the order. Now, around the medium risk behavior, what I've chosen to classify as medium risk is every other behavior that I have here. And you can see these are all set at 20 authentications. And what that means is that I'm going to check to see if I've seen the city in the last 20 authentications, this device in the last 20 authentications. And if I have, the user can continue forward and they'll just be able to log in seamlessly, which we will see today, uh, without any additional steps. But if I haven't seen that behavior before, I will actually go in and require the user to use a secondary factor. Now, you can also even set these policies as different requirements. So while I did classify the same behavior layers for new country, new state, and velocity, you can see I did choose to actually just set it for password plus any factor for my high risk and then set for my medium risk a requirement of the same thing. So whatever this looks like for you, you can adjust it to make sense for your environment by both policies as well as different user types. Now, once you've actually gotten, given your user the access that they wanted or the set the policies for how to determine whether a user can be authenticated, the next step is making sure that the user is only given the level of access that they should, they should have. And so for this, I've set specific scopes based on the user's security access level. So you can see I have access high security and access standard. 
I've then implemented policies that are set for the specific application I'll be showing. And then I've separated them by group saying that high security users can only authenticate with the authorization code and they have access to the high security and uh, standard levels of access, but their access token lifetime has been set to a lower level. So 10 minutes for the access token. And even the refresh token has a time restriction of one hour. So it won't continue to renew access tokens after that initial hour. And even then it'll expire if the user is not using the access token every 15 minutes. Whereas my standard user, they only have access to the standard level. And therefore I've actually increased the token lifetime. I've increased it to 15 minutes. The refresh token is actually unlimited as long as the user continues to use it every 30 minutes. So again, adjusting for what it makes sense in your environment, but being able to scope it specifically to the users that are accessing the specific application at that time. In addition to that, I can actually pass in specific information my application may need. So you can see I have various different claims here for the end user and the different information that may make sense for my environment to adjust what's being shown to them. And to show what this looks like in terms of authentication, we can see that if I come in through here and I try to request for my big deal user, I'm gonna go ahead and request some standard scopes with open ID and profile, but I'm also gonna request the ones that I've set, set specifically around security and standard access. And then we'll see that the token's going to reflect this. So this is gonna include your city organization and state that I showed in the claims, that custom claims I made, as well as the different scopes that I've just requested as the end user. Now, if I try to switch to my standard user who did not have access to the high security, We'll see that they're going to be blocked from getting access to that based on the policy configurations until I remove that request and actually update it so that it's only requesting the standard. Then to show what this actually looks like on the end user side, if we come over to our environment and I log in with my, my big deal user, which will have a longer password, we'll see that they are in fact granted access to the high security and high and standard. In this case, I have only requested the access token, which is why that's all we're seeing here, return here, but we still can identify which user was requesting it and what information, what scopes that they were allowed to granted access to. Now, once I log out, I'll be able to show that my standard user who has a shorter password can log in. And in this case, my user is actually going to be set to require for MFA. Now, the reason why, and we'll see this in the system log, is I reset this user's behavior profile before I logged in so that none of the information about their last login was known and we could be triggered, the risk could be classified as a high risk and be and trigger a policy. So in this case, the user is required to choose whatever policy they want. I'm going to get a text message that Okta has sent to me to type in. Once I type it in here, I can verify it. And then you can see I'm logged in with a fairly seamless process, even though I had to implement a higher level of security for the end user. And then once I'm authenticated, the level of access has been scoped to my specific account. Going into the actual profiles that we just saw, we can see that the system log here captured all of this information, including whether or not the user was high risk. So in this case, the policy indicated that none of this was known. So as I mentioned, I reset the profile. It was classified as high, uh, high level of risk, and I was prompted for the MFA as I was expect as I was expecting. On my access token or for my big deal user, we can see that this user was authenticated but was not prompted for those additional requirements because everything was negative. So while they had a higher level of access, they hadn't changed anything in their activity that would suggest that they needed to have that stepped up authentication. So we allowed them to log in with a seamless process. In addition to that, we're also capturing information around where the user is logging in from, what day, what time, what type of device are they using at that time of login. And as we'll see with HESTO, this information can also be used uh, in powerful ways also. And as one final note on this, with customer identity, there's a lot that can be implemented, but all of this can be implemented on the workforce side as well. And the first line of defense in protecting your customers is going to be protecting your employees also. So with that being said, I will hand it off to Hesta to tell us about how they are using Okta today to protect their customers. Thank you, Heather. And uh, that really set the scene for us. Um, so, you know, I have the um, privilege of leading our strategic enterprise direction and Okta is a platform that we use actively in the workforce in our workforce space. Uh, and so when we were, um, when we encountered the challenge of our digital platform, 
you know, one of the things we were focused on was, well, how do we maintain and secure the trust with our customers while still optimising their experience? So today we'll give you some insights on how we've gone about solving that problem. Just a little bit about Hester. Hester is a superannuation fund in Australia. That means that we help people save for and secure a financial position for their retirement. Um, we are in the business of managing pensions, actually, um, simply put. Uh, our focus is really in the health and community services industry um, and that therefore a large percentage of our customers or majority of our customers are healthcare workers, um, nurses, preschool educators um, and aged care professionals. Uh, an interesting um, insight about our demographics, 80% of our customers are females, are women actually. We have offices all over Australia and uh, we have a membership base close to 900,000. I wanted to talk a little bit about our purpose because I think, and, and what motivates us at HISTA, because I think it's important to understand what anchors some of the decisions that we make from a technology perspective. So our promise is to be gutsy advocates that drive meaningful change for generations to come. Now, what does that mean? Um, as we advocate on behalf of nurses and those that are in the front line, a large percentage of our customers will retire on small um, retirement balances. And so we want to ensure that we can do everything to support them through their journey in securing the financial position they want to enjoy the retirement that they choose to enjoy, not only um, in the goals, life goals that they have, but also in the world they retire into. So our purpose is really to make a real difference to their financial future. And one of our ambitions is that is to be the super fund of choice. We want um, particularly those that are focused in the health and community services sector to um, choose HESTA as their um, superannuation fund for life. And we want to partner with them in that journey. Because of the nature um, of our membership base, um, all of our customers are largely frontline workers who you know, work across a 24 by seven time period. They are shift workers, they work at 2 a.m., they work at 10 a.m. Um, and across the day. And so we've embarked on a digital journey to provide our customers with the ability to engage with HESTA um, whenever they want, wherever they want, through a digital experience. Um, our architecture, our digital architecture specifically, has focused across all layers, which includes, you know, obviously cloud engineering, DevOps and automation. Um, how do we uh, change um, with a level of speed and velocity? But also how do we deliver a really strong um, experience, which includes ease of, ease of use, while still maintaining our customers' trust? When our customers engage with us digitally, we want to ensure that they trust that the transaction or the engagement that they have with us is secure and also make it as easy as possible for them to interact. Um, and so, you know, we, we are on a journey and we did go through that experience of trying to figure out how we balance um, what security looks like for our customers and for us, but also to ensure that we continue to maintain our member experience. We um, have a, a set of principles that uh, drive um, some of our decision making and one of the key ones is to ensure that we design security at the core. So security, secure by design is a key principle for us alongside um, experience and an effective member experience. As a result, um, we have, we've looked at some key drivers for our decision making. So in any um, technology problem we're trying to solve, um, understanding our members and understanding what we're trying to achieve and who they are and what they're trying to achieve um, is really critical to us. So these are some of the key drivers that helped us make the decisions that we made when we were looking at how we balanced that idea of trusted experience or trusted engagement with a really strong member experience. As I mentioned before, our members are frontline workers. They're nurses, they're preschool educators, and they're aged care professionals. They are rostered across a 24 by seven time period. So we want them to engage with us whenever they are able to, in those micro moments when they take breaks at 2 a.m. or you know after a school drop off at um, 
eight thirty, nine o'clock in the morning, wherever, whenever opportunity um, is available for them to make a decision or take action, we want to be there for them. And so we appreciate that they're busy, and we want the dig- their digital experience to be um, easy. We want them to be able to engage with a high degree of ease. We want to be available when they need us for information guidance and when our members choose to take action because we know that when they take action, it enables them to, um, it makes a real difference to their financial retirement and their financial investment. And so ensuring that when our members choose to engage, they know that their engagement is secure, but that it is really easy for them to connect with us. And because of those drivers, um, we've had a look at some really key options around this space in our digital um, platforms. And Abby will walk you through some of those and give you an insight on the architecture that now drives our um, security and our experience in that platform. Thank you, Sheena. Um, It's wonderful to be with you virtually in uh, today's and age digital world. Um, Those key customer drivers were predominantly our um, involved in our selection criteria. So let us um, go through where we started and how did we arrive here? We, as a technology business, we really um, advocate business be- before technology. So throughout our opinion analysis, um, we were really keying in on three different angles, time, cost, and quality. Um, so one of the options was to go down the path of open source IDP selections, given the available skill sets and other consideration. Among other evaluated options, um, we thought Okta is not only checking all the boxes, but it provides the important flexibility to enable our hybrid and loosely coupled architecture. Um, when we say loosely coupled architecture, we had um, three key objectives in mind. We want to be able to um, provide the best experience for our member base uh, in a seamless migration at the forefront uh, where we enable our user whitelisting to also enable our face migration approach. So in essence, uh, what we meant to uh, derive from the selection criteria is we want to enable a technology toolkit that is not only achieving some of these key objectives, but also gives us this foundational bending block that enables our future use cases. Um, above all, I think uh, we were somewhat lucky. We had existing relationship with Okta for Workforce ID or Corporate ID, we refer to it as, uh, where we orchestrate um, a lot of uh, business apps to uh, integrate for SSO, single sign-on, etc. So we chosen the path of extending our relationship or footprint from um, Okta being servicing our workforce ID to actually also do consumer identity and access management. Um, let's, let us look at um, probably a very, very high level conceptual architecture um, in, a, in a key building blocks. So uh, our web app is effectively hosted on our Adobe Experience Cloud. Um, built on a React technology um, that was proudly co-designed with some of our members, active members. Um, one thing important to note for out of this architecture is we at a trust, we as a trustee office uh, being Hesta, we do not host any customer data locally within our jurisdiction. At least that is true for now. Um, we are source a lot of our fund administration function to our key strategic partner. They host our core registry, accounts, et cetera. They also provide member-facing contact center in um, serving our member base when they have a need to call someone, get some help. So if what we end up doing is um, architecting for a feature and a very, very loosely decoupled architecture, build sets of APIs that orchestrate um, multiple data points to serve our application. Um, We have existing, we had existing, and we continue to invest in 
our existing iPaaS platform, that is Dalbimi uh, iPaaS platform, where JVMs are hosted in our AWS tenancy to make sure that we have the ability to do all the cool things with what we need to orchestrate for serving any digital channel, not only member application. Um, so in all that, Okta played a key, key role for us as a true consumer identity and access management. Um, I'd like to actually give us a few take home. Um, some of the learnings um, we anticipated and um, our key principle really enabled us to uh, take home some learning from those uh, principles also. Uh, first, number one is um, cloud native and decoupled architecture not only enable us realize our objective on a timely manner, but they also enable us to make sure that we future-proof our architecture. Um, Gartner refers to it as the life cycle of technology evolution. Uh, gone old days uh, were more or less 10 to 15 years. It has evolved to less than 10 years and um, very optimistic about that evolution continues. Um, so we, don't want, we do not want to lock into um, a very, very tight couple architecture that sort of constrain our future use cases. Um, number two is think security from customer lens also. We uh, quite frequently focus on securing perimeter, securing all the backend system, which is by no means I would recommend not to do so, but also have the balance from what is the customer wants? How do we enable that balance from a customer lens? We want to be able to give them a very, very intuitive, interactive digital channels that seamlessly integrate across cohort of system in a very, very secure manner. So as long that trust is upfront position from a customer lens, I think um, you know we do a great deal of learning from this two-way relationship. Uh, number three um, was always uh, in our back of our mind, but um, uh, you know it's very important to understand resilience and scale play a key role in all of these incremental steps. So we don't want to be constrained by the ability to not able to incrementally add um, an additional stack. So for instance, uh, we may not have a local data as a reference to serve our application or a digital channel. How do we keep adding more and more technological stack without having to re-engineer the whole into an architecture? So from architecture to how did we plan the migration? Um, our principle again was intake. We want to be able to provide that seamless interaction of member experience. They do not need to maintain two different logins from old portal to a new portal. We didn't have um, a good uh, sense of check. We do everything what we do. We actually do a check with our member base. What do they think? These are the most engaged users. So our early um, sense into their likability was if we were to ask more than 800,000 members to reset their password, I think we would have lost that engagement upfront straight away uh, rather than you know um, promoting the new member portal with more doability from digital service channel. Um, so I think among all these di different options, we had to orchestrate, orchestrate a migration process that sort of runs in parallel, all member portal, all legacy authentication, new member portal with fancy and secure member login while they don't even notice who you know if they um they are using the old or new the only difference was when they are logged into the portal the look and feel would be different from um be it as uh, be it as a menu item or whatnot so effectively in the migration process what we do is um we we wrote a bunch of um logic behind the scene to be able to validate a user punching in um, their member ID. The logic decide if that user is whitelisted for a migration or for a migration tranches. 
Um, seamlessly, what we do is we fetch the details. We, we, we first of all, we let them log in using the legacy IDP creds, but seamlessly, we migrate all these attributes to Okta and other um, systems that is um, providing services to the new member portal, such as uh, MDH um, and Okta, of course. And next time when they log in with the same user ID, they don't need to go through uh, fetching these attributes from behind the scene. So all of that work was being able to achieve. We had um, invested in some test cases uh, from a user reference point of view. They are being directed to the same DNS entry point. The logic actually decides whether they are already migrated or they are already um, their first time login and they need to be migrated seamlessly. Uh, we're quite proud of that process. That gives us a lot of um, a uh, lot of likability, not only likability, but um, um, also gave us a lot of meaningful insights where the customers or members' pain points were. Right. Um, apart from architecting the best toolkit, making sure the user experience is balanced, we do not stop there. We need to continuously monitor all the login events to be able to proactively decipher on any unwanted traffic or um, before something bad occurs, how do we bring this trend analysis? So with three line of defense in mind, identity plays a key role. Um, we ingest all the consumer identity management instance of log into our Sumo logic and we build dashboard as what you see on the screen. Um, that, that dashboard is not just there for um, the BAU team, but importantly, our 24-7 SOC, who is not just conventional SOC, who also monitors 24-7 uh, uh, log and activity across 365 days, 24-7. Uh, but they also have the ability to, um, to uh, pass on some of these unknown event among the SOC enabled blue team and red team, how do we make sense from some of these intel and make sure that um, the noise is being set aside, but whatever intelligence we can trend out towards um, in, in, in an event that is uh, hasn't occurred yet, but how do we actually bring that intelligence upfront across our distributed architecture and a full stack um, uh, systems to serve any need from a consumer identity. So with that in mind, I think um, uh, we, we, we uh, spend some time on analyzing the log and making sure that we proactively readjust these dashboards to provide better intelligence, not only to provide the secure and best experience, but also this plays a key role, which Sheena would talk about in the next slide. How do we actually do the continuous uh, tapping into customers' um, uh, NPS scoring and whatnot? Gina, over to you. Thank you, Abby. So we're trying to answer the question today of, did we find the right balance between security and experience? Um, and we're mindful of who our customers are. As I mentioned, our customers are frontline workers. Uh, and we thought we'd let them speak directly um, through this. You know, did we get there? Uh, we're continuously monitoring um, this information, but since we went live, we did a soft launch in about February, March of 2020. So right in the middle or at the start of um, obviously a really unusual year. Um, and what we can see is that our customers um, have responded positively. So the experience has been um, better than industry standard uh, and we will continue to evolve. We will continue to work on improving how we deliver um, services to our members um, because it is important to us. Um, but this, these scores are definitely reflective um, that we're on the right track. Thank you both so much. We really appreciate you sharing your story and how you've leveraged Okta in your environment. You mentioned that you considered other providers or you considered other solutions. What was it that hit the scales towards Okta for you? I can take that one. Um, so I think there were um, um, 
three key criteria for us. Um, we didn't we didn't have the luxury of um, introducing another relationship, another technology toolkit into our ecosystem. So um, our competitive edge was really to bank on the existing um, Okta relationship for the workforce ID, and it was quite natural to um, to compare that against what we can achieve with other providers. The second uh, key was really, um, we did have um, consideration around going open source, but from the time we implement and from the time you, you know, really go through that um, uh, best experience sort of lens, including learning the open source and customizing all your, work, uh, all your sort of, you know, use cases, I think that was being dropped out quite quickly because what we don't have is the time in luxury. Let's give all the heavy lifting to the best player in market, such as Okta, and we can retrofit um, what we need to do to enable the business um, side of ability. So I think um, these two were pretty critical. The last but not least one was really, um, um, I think when we benchmark the uh, a like-for-life -life comparison of what uh, competitors or even open source offers, um, there's always a variance on the maturity level of um, how do we orchestrate uh, logs and how do we orchestrate some of the functional in a single sort of pane of glass view. I think that was another uh, tipping point for us to actually go down the route of uh, leveraging of the power of Okta. Thank you. And when we first started talking to Okta, was there any um concerns or hesitations that you had that the team uh overcame throughout that process that helped you feel more comfortable as you were making the decision to move forward i, th I think it was a very smooth transition um we had a very engaged discussion from uh, the time we went out to a market for some sort of high level scan um it was uh, pretty pretty intuitive pretty engaged and all the informations were timely um comebacks for us to decide uh, pretty much on a fast track I also want to add, um, Heather, that we um, had a pre-existing relationship with Okta on the workforce side. And, you know, we uh, I did speak a little bit about who Hester is and um, having our partners understand who we're servicing as our customer base is really critical to us. And I think we have that partnership with Okta today. It was proven out through our workforce um you know, the implementation and the architecture that we have on the workforce side. And so we, we felt that we could trust Okta to help us come on this journey. No doubt we had a variety of different options um, that we needed to work through, some probably more challenging than others. But I think that, you know, this is where a true partnership is about coming to the table and figuring some of the um, solutions out together. Um, and I feel we got that support. So that helped us get to the finish line and help us achieve what we wanted to achieve. Well, I think that, that uh, with that, we're gonna go ahead and wrap uh, up our session, but we appreciate you all uh, joining us today.